Awesome. Thank you so much for that intro. And I'm really looking forward to delivering this webinar. Although the topic of compliance to some can be pretty boring, um, zero trust, kind of a marketing buzzword these days, but um, some of the technologies that we're going to use to um, to implement or, or can use to implement a, um, a zero trust environment and solve for a lot of the compliance uh, challenges that that we see certainly around networking, you know, the, the technology itself is pretty exciting. Um, and so we're gonna start with kind of an overview of the landscape. What is, what is trust? If we're gonna talk about zero trust um, and then we're gonna, we'll, we'll, I, I, I know that, uh, you know, webinars like this, we're gonna have a, a wide distribution of audience members. Some people who are interested in the advanced stuff, some people who are brand new and uh, just getting into this. So we'll try to set the context for everyone and um, and and get into it. So my name is Christian Posta. I'm the global field CTO here at a company called Solo.io. And what we work on is service mesh technology. And I've been involved with um, with the service mesh ecosystem for quite a long time now. Um, I've been involved in, in working with customers and large organizations who are deploying things like microservices and containers and Kubernetes. Um, my background is in connecting systems through integration and messaging and, and generally distributed systems. I've written a few books on the topics that we're gonna be talking about today including Istio in Action, which was published probably a year ago, uh, still very relevant and, um, and up to date, uh, mostly because the Istio project has become very mature and um, you know, things don't, aren't changing very, very much. However, one area of the technology that is undergoing some innovation right now is in the, in the data plane. And Lynn Sun and I recently co-authored a, a book uh, published back in October around basically the topic we're going to discuss today. So I won't go into too much of that right now. But at Solo, like I said, we focus on connecting systems, securing systems um, that, um, that are deployed you know, in, in enterprise. And as probably some of you know, we're on this webinar right now. Webinars are, are uh, enterprises are not all that uh, and all that all that cut and clean and nice, right? There's uh, there's a lot of um, we do it here because that's how we've always done it. There's a lot of uh, we have we ha we're doing it this way because that's what security told us we have to do, um, or you know just a, a whole whole combination of reasons. But we what we do is we try to. Um, we, we, we try to offer a solution to problems that have cropped up as people start to adopt modern platforms, um, certainly around service to service connectivity, um, around um, security, certainly. And that's why we'll, we'll be talking about some of the topics today. And, uh, you know, we, we based our platforms and our technology on open source projects like Istio. For example, Istio is the service mesh that we'll be talking about today, like um, things like eVPF that we can use to implement and uh, improve the behavior of some of the networking technologies that, that we're using. Um, and, and so at, at Solo, you know, we've been working with uh, a, a large number of customers around the world very successfully to, uh, to solve challenges around observability and security and, um, and connectivity. And uh, we're certainly leaders in some of these open source projects. And, uh, you know, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of insight into how to be successful with these technologies. So let's get to the meat of the webinar here. And that's around compliance, zero trust, and what technologies we might be able to use to implement and, and solve for some of these, uh, these challenges. But if we're going to talk about zero trust or no trust, then we should talk about what, it, what, what is trust. Um, and you can go to a dictionary and look it up. It's fairly consistent for what we want to talk about here. 
but it's about uh, representing yourself or some entity and credibly understanding what that entity is going to do, that it says it's going to do. Um, that um, there's credibility in, in, um, in, in, that, in that entity. Um, and that uh, you know, they have, they might get access to certain data, certain services, um, resources, I guess we'll call them more generically, based on this trust. And in organizations today, or maybe more classically, um, that type of that type of trust or over trusting uh, leads to scenarios that are not very positive for for those companies. You, know, you see, see things like security breaches, um, customer data, you know, um, financial data, um, and this happens quite a lot, unfortunately. And a, a big part of how that, that trust in a system, a distributed information system is created is through the classic approach to applying security to an organizational boundary. And oftentimes that's seen as, or known as perimeter-based security. If we just stand up these big walls around our organization and our network, then you know we'll keep the bad people or the bad actors out. Um, you know, and, and you'll probably see this is obviously a simplification, but you'll see, you know, there is a path for um, traffic to come in into an organization through various firewalls, you know, perimeter-based like uh, demilitarized zones that might be facing the internet, uh, corporate internal networks maybe establishing VPNs into these corporate networks. Um, and then if you're a developer and you're building services APIs, probably familiar with, uh, we'll go into it a little bit more, the, uh, the, some of the complexity that it takes to get access to data and, and databases. And that's for you know, the, a, a noble reason, at least, to try to secure and align with, uh, with compliance. Because we want to keep the bad actors from gaining access to this sensitive data, which is, you know, customer data, internal financial data, um, and, and other sensitive information. This might, you know, going a level deeper, I resonate with some folks, certainly, again, those that are uh, working at large enterprises that, you know, rely on things like DMZ security that rely heavily on the uh, firewalling appliances that most likely live in those environments and how the network and the security has been constructed to align with things like compliance and regulatory oversight and, and so on. Um, you know, you might see um, things like gateways uh, at the application layers, API gateways that handle traffic coming in from the internet or even just traffic internally inside the organization. But what, what, you, what, you, what you see here is traffic is segmented, right? The DMZ can't directly talk to, let's say, the, the core databases or maybe mainframes, um, but certain layers can. But if you look at each individual layer, there's a lot of trust in each of those layers where we're assuming that if you're in one of those layers that you might have access to other services, other components, other resources within those layers. And maybe if you can somehow impersonate being uh, a, a resource in that layer, you can get to some of the other layers as well. Um, and so that's where we kind of want to um, rethink or at least understand what is the trust that we're giving to a, a, a particular part of, of the system and what is the blast radius? What, what can happen in those scenarios? Um, because it's not just the outside 
uh, look, you know, trying trying to get in. Uh, there are things like misconfigurations. There are things like bad policies. There are scenarios where there's a perfectly running good API, but we're sharing too much information in those APIs. Um, there are certainly scenarios where uh, bad actors don't breach or somehow uh, overcome the firewall. They're invited in and through phishing, social you know, um, engineering type attacks, and, and they're, they're just there. So the question doesn't become, you know, how do we keep these bad actors out? It's once they get in, how do we limit the, 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 their access and their lateral movement and the trust that's inherent in the system we need to scope down so that, uh, they, that these, these bad actors can't take advantage of that. Now that was that, you know, the last couple of diagrams we've looked at are kind of thinking about one organization and, you know, at its most simplistic form. But in reality, these organizations, as they modernize their technology, they look for ways to move quicker and experiment with technology. They adopt cloud services. Um, they, want, uh, they want to build a platform that allows them to go quicker. So they're using containers and um, cloud automation, CICD built around it and so on. We'll see that there's a natural evolution of the technology stack, some running on-premises, probably a lot running on-premises, and you know things moving to a, a public cloud uh, and maybe multiple public clouds. And so the, this idea of, well, here's the perimeter and this is what makes up our corporate network is, is obviously is, is, is dissolving in this case because the applications are being deployed onto these cloud networks and we don't own, the organization doesn't own these cloud networks. It's somebody else's infrastructure that we're renting, right? Um, and so now that, that corporate network is, um, is, is highly distributed and is uh, you know who owns it? What are the what are the security? If you want to install firewalls and all this stuff, you know there's a lot more that goes into making that work, and a lot more areas where that can fall short. Now you throw on top of it that the the business functions that these these organizations are, are there for, um, and whether that's financial companies whether that's um, health, you know, health insurance, health, uh, health related, those retail that are handling financial transactions and so on, um, any of the federal agencies, like these are governed by, um, you know, regulations and laws and, and rules that they have to and should, um, you know, hold closely and guard and secure the uh, that, that that sensitive information that gets shared with them, uh, from whether it's customers or financial information or or other, and there's, there's various um, com compliance and, and restrictions and uh, like I said, regulatory and, and and audits that happen to ensure that this these standards are upheld. Uh, and we can look at each each one of them. Um, they're not all that exciting. As I mentioned in the beginning, they all they all kind of boil down to um, what would seem like common sense things, but are not all that common. Um, and that is maintaining a secure network, restricting access to sensitive information. Um, when there are vulnerabilities discovered, uh, tracking, understanding that they exist, so paying attention, uh, potentially working with um, with uh, uh, governing bodies or vendors or uh, partners who, who can help with this and implement strong controls and, uh, and networking controls and, and access to this, uh, this data so that not just anyone can, can access it. And what, what we've seen is, in, you know, the implementation and ends up sort of looking like this, um, 
but as I as I also mentioned, you know, as we go to um, highly dynamic environments like uh, spinning up a VM on the fly, tearing it down, spinning up containers on the fly, scheduling them across multiple machines, um, you know, maybe across multiple clusters and multiple clouds. You know, just the fact that you're going to a public cloud, all all of these things make the uh, the classic way of looking at solving these problems by establishing boundaries and and perimeters um, a, a, a lot less um, you know impactful because uh, there's there's you know we we don't take into account the inherent trust that gets placed in those boundaries. And so that's where this idea of zero trust comes into the picture. Um, what we wanna do is we want to restrict down to the smallest possible scope where trust is granted. And we, we assume that just because you're in one of these perimeters or in these boundaries doesn't mean that you're a good actor or that you should be trusted. Uh, in other words, we want to, we want to constantly assume that there, that, it, you know, basically just assume things are on the public internet that everything's hostile, everything's coming to get you. Um, and that when services need to communicate with each other or when an API or an application needs to share data that we should on demand, we should we should prove that the the actor that's requesting that is trustworthy, and we want to continue to do that. Uh, we want to scrutinize all of the access, and we want to log all of the access, and we want to be able to go back and 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 uh, um, see exactly what has happened. Um, and so, and and like I said, we want to we want to eliminate trust islands or um or you know we we, we want to scope the the uh, who who we trust and where we trust them down as far as far as possible so if we come back and look at that very simplified probably oversimplified diagram um we want traffic as it comes in to be authenticated we want it to so we want to know who it is we want it to be authorized so based on who it is and what services are being called, what are they allowed access to? And we want to do that dynamically. And we want uh, we want to do that in, in such a way that holds up. So you can see in this diagram where we're maybe in the in the past we would have an API gateway that might be looking at and, and establishing some of those properties, authentication authorization in one spot. We don't want to just trust that because the traffic makes through that gateway that it's all good. Uh, we don't want lateral movement. So what we want to do is we want to continuously and dynamically enforce the uh, the same security properties uh, on any request on any service service access, even if that means across multiple different clusters, different workload types. VMs, containers, functions of service. We uh, we want to uphold these these principles of zero trust, regardless of where the uh, the, uh, the applications are running. Now, there's uh, quite a lot of literature on this that kind of kind of goes into some more uh, more detail. Things like um, uh, the the NIST standards around zero trust. Things like uh, the Google Cloud Papers. Um, there's some very early papers from I think it's the Department of Defense that uh, that discussed this even you know 20 years ago. Um, and so there's, there's there's a lot of good I would call it um, you know academic papers on on these things. But when it comes down to how you actually implement this? There's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of, and and I would I would argue that until recently, it's been kind of difficult to implement this consistently and in a performant way, 
um, um, because the technology wasn't, wasn't ready for it. But if we boil it down a little bit more and, and, and talk in specifics, what we want to establish is that communication in the network is to, to any resources is secured regardless of what island or firewall or boundary or perimeter is established. So all communication, even if it's inside, especially if it's inside one of those perimeters. The, the access is determined dynamically. It is um, determined per session, or you can, think, you can think more concretely, for every request that's coming into a service. So not just the, not just the open a connection, right? Firewalls typically are looking at, can a layer three, layer four connection be established? We want to go deeper than that. Can a request be sent? Can it be received and can it be serviced by a, a resource? And since we're determining this dynamically, that can change uh, you know, from request to request. So we have this fine-grained control over our, you know, wh where and when we're establishing trust. All access is authenticated and authorized, and this access is tracked. It's logged. It's audited. We can we can go back and uh, and review it. And based on, you know, um, based on this audit, we can dynamically also control access. So if we're seeing that a particular user in the system is requesting uh, a sensitive data and it's unusual let's say that it would it would um request this data what a pick a number i don't know a certain number of times 20 times um then you know after after about 10 15 20 we start to notice and the system can automatically reverse some of the uh some of the access that had already been given and if if you look at the way at least abstractly that um, zero trust networking and these types of architectures are implemented it's usually with some kind of uh, coordination between a policy enforcement point that is handling traffic on behalf of a resource and some policy engine and, and and this engine together with some administrator that's uh, you know driving uh, driving the policy changes that that might be needed. So these these policy enforcement points sit in line with the with the request, and decisions are made in line and dynamically based on certain policies that have been set or uh, different parameters that again could be dynamic. And, uh, and and various attributes and context of the request that can be uh, evaluated. Now, again, this is a very abstract way of uh, of looking at a, at a at how you would implement this, but this is in, certainly an area where service mesh, a uh, a technology that's specifically built for these types of dynamic environments, can help. Service mesh. You know, has a lot of uh, a lot of overlap with the you know in terms of implementation, a lot of overlap with uh, with a model like this, and uh, and so from here what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how a service mesh might fit, but we also want to see how the evolution of service mesh and how we can refine and improve the implementation of service mesh so that we don't end up with these. Uh, policy enforcement points scattered and littered all over the place unnecessarily. So we got to start with what is uh, what what is a service mesh? And I'll go through this kind of kind of quickly, but the uh, the idea behind the service mesh is to solve some of the challenges that that come up when applications want to communicate with each other. Security is a big part of that. Uh, but when services Communicate with each other. Usually, we're looking at APIs communicating services, service to service, and we're thinking more along the lines of requests and messages that are being sent. Um, you know, they have to solve for 
you know, those, those networking challenges that we see in service to service communication, like service discovery, load balancing, uh, resilient aspects. So when services are not available, can we fall back? Can we retry? At least be thinking about things like timeouts. When you start building distributed systems, we have to think quite a bit differently than if we were just building a you know monolithic type application because the network is such a critical player in the implementation. Now, when we go and solve for things like resilience, like telemetry collection, like security, and and so on. If if especially if we have a lot of different programming languages, um, you know, we need to have a way to solve these problems consistently, uh, and not worry about maintaining certain libraries or frameworks. Not worry about all of the overhead of governance and making sure that developers use the right languages, frameworks the correct way. Patching, maintaining, patching CVEs, fixing bugs, etc. Uh, across this becomes pretty, you know, the, 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 there's a large, a large amount of investment that has to go into that. So with the service mesh, what we, what we see is we implement those networking challenges, um, like connectivity, security, reliability, et cetera, as a agent that lives with the application and the application instance. And this agent gets deployed with the application instance, ha handles these things on its behalf. Um, and if you're, if you're, if you're uh, insightful enough, you'll notice that this agent becomes or can become a enforcement point of certain networking and security policies. So in the, in the service mesh, we have these little agents, they run with the, uh, the applications, they act as proxies, they act as the uh, policy enforcement points, and they are all remotely controlled and configured by a component we call the control plane. So the control plane is connecting to these various agents and it's giving the agents dynamically its, you know, it, what, what policies it's, it's supposed to be enforcing. And those agents can reach back out to elements of the control plane to more dynamically determine, you know, uh, what, uh, what 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 a policy should be. And policies are usually should this request continue or should it not continue. And that that uh, determination is based on uh, who's calling the service on behalf of what user and other attributes like location, like time, like claims that the user might have. Um, and, and, and so on. So you can start to see that the service mesh has a lot of the element and the architecture for implementing the, uh, the zero trust networking principles that we're after. And here's maybe a more simplified example where, the, where an application wants to talk to another application. The request from the app on the left side when it talks over the network, we'll be, we'll, you know, we'll be forced through this agent or this proxy that then, you know, does things like service discovery, load balancing, timeouts, retries, telemetry collection. And it can also do things like originating TLS or expecting um, that the transport will require mutual TLS. So it, it can coordinate with the control plane, get the correct certificates, and um, you know start to it, encrypt and uh, secure the channel for service-to-service -service communication. And on the right-hand side, we can see the agent or the proxy on the on the app there can do the same thing. It can uh, expect mutual TLS. It can enforce policies about whether the service on the left can even talk with this service. Um, it can evaluate the requests that are coming through and dynamically determine whether those requests are allowed through. Um, and, and fundamentally, the service mesh here can also establish workload identity for each of these services. So we know without a doubt that the service on the left, let's say we call it foo, is the foo service. And the service on the right, call it bar, is, is, is that service. 
So we can get identity, we can get um, networking policies based on identity, not on IP addresses and location of the network and so on, but actually on, on workload identity. Um, and, and then we can get an encrypted tra uh, tunnel between these services. We can't have man in the middle, we can't have uh, oh, uh, eaves, eavesdroppers and so on, trying to capture the traffic and replay it. Um, and then we can write fine grain authorization policies about how that, um, how that traffic is allowed to continue. So I was generically describing a service mesh, but um, we know at, at, at Solo, at least, we are heavily invested in Istio and the Istio community. We see that service mesh as uh, the most dominant service mesh, as the most mature service mesh. Um, and that, that observation comes from, you know, a, first of all, a period of neutrality, because from about 2017 to say 2019, we were sitting and watching and seeing what, what is happening in the service mesh space, because there was a lot of different players and wasn't clear who was gonna take off. But then around 2019, uh, and a lot of work that we were doing in, in the community, um, you know, we, we saw that, okay, it's, it's pretty clear now, um, Istio is becoming um, very well adopted. A lot of those, those uh, thorny edge cases and, and use cases that we would see in the enterprise were being, uh, they were being um, you know, softened and, and we were able to make it fit. And uh, you know, now advanced use cases, multi-cluster, VMs, all, all of that stuff, Istio is uh, very well uh, capable of, of handling. And we saw last fall, 2022, that Istio uh, officially made it into the CNCF. Um, and uh, you know, has, has a regular deployment release, has uh, um, a lot of contributions from the community, a very diverse, um in involvement and uh, continuing to see uh, massive adoption of, um, of of this technology so we talked a little bit about the model here that service mesh presents um we you know we we, we can see that it has the components has the pieces in the right places to to implement a zero trust networking architecture. However, what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this webinar now is, can this be improved? Um, are, there, are there some drawbacks to sending a bunch of different agents and, and proxies out, out there? And, and uh, you know, can that be improved? So the first thing I'll, I'll point you to is a blog that we wrote a year and a half ago now um, that kind of represented where where we were looking at, we being here here at Solo, where we were looking um, in terms of service mesh, some of the some of the innovation that was uh, possible. Um, what what were the challenges we were seeing our customers run into? Uh, service mesh adoption is primarily led by some of these security and compliance requirements. Uh, but once you start operationalizing the mesh, what are what are some of the friction points? What are some of the what are, what are some of the issues that uh, that people will run into? And and so we wrote this blog, and it kind of outlined four different. Um, Four different areas that our customer base, our user base, was uh, very interested in, and how we can, um, you know, get better resource overhead, or how we can isolate feature usage and configuration between different teams a little better, and uh, and, and security and and day two operations upgrading. These were the variables that we were looking through. Um, and, and we, we asked our, ourselves for, for some of the challenges that crop up, is there a different model where we can get the same or the, the good parts of the service mesh and alleviate some of the, the, the challenging parts? And so we looked at different models, maybe sidecar is not the only approach. 
maybe uh, using something like a shared agent or a shared proxy, you know, this will get you much better resource overhead and uh, and potentially upgrade uh, impact is upgrade, easier to upgrade if there's only one. Um, and but we, we we saw these as almost two extremes. One that uh, is extremely fine grained and gets great feature isolation, you know, good good security granularity, a little bit more difficult to upgrade. Uh, and then the other side of the or we're, we flip the the benefits and the pros and cons there. But is there something in the middle? Is there is there an approach that we can take that's kind of in the middle that will give us the best of both worlds? And uh, and so this is what we what we what we talked about back in that in that paper in that blog a year and a half ago. We were actually working on this. We were actually building it at the time. Uh, and then just through our work in the community, you know, it's, uh, Solo is, uh, is a prominent leader in the Istio community. A lot of us here at Solo are uh, part of the founding of the Istio community. And, um, you know, we have positions on the technical oversight committee, on the steering committee, and the various working groups. Um, you know, so that we have a dedicated engineering team working on Istio directly. So, I mean, we, 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 we saw and worked with our partners and understood kind of what's happening. And we came across uh, that Google was working on something very similar. And uh, so we ended up collaborating together, kind of proving out the, you know, whether this even makes any sense. And then in September, 2022, we announced that we would be contributing this work, sort of the, the beginnings of, of this work to the SD open source community. And what it is, is an approach to running Istio in a sidecar list mode that allows you to take advantage of the capabilities of the service mesh, including some of the properties around zero trust that we, that we want, um, and do that in a way that Simplifies operations, uh, so things like upgrades, extremely important. Things like onboarding applications into the mesh, extremely important. Um, and, uh, and 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 we can some of the side benefits are things like reducing costs. Right now we run fewer proxies. We have to think a little bit less about allocating resources for those prox proxies. Uh, in certain areas where we can improve performance of the mesh, uh, especially if you're just leveraging the mesh for uh, workload identity and um, networking policy. So we don't have to take on the full capabilities of a layer seven proxy, which is what um, which is what the Istio data plane does today in, in the sidecar approach. So, um, a handful of, of different, um, uh, I would call them ancillary benefits, but then also a handful of extremely beneficial operational benefits that we can get out of a, out of a model like this. So how does this end up working? We saw in previous diagrams that the service mesh is implemented in terms of an agent or a proxy that gets co-located with the application instances. In the Istio ambient data plane, um, we take those proxies out of, of the application. We don't take them out of the request path. So they're still in, in the request path. But what we end up doing is using a little bit lower level networking control to force traffic through what we're calling the secure overlay layer secure transport, secure overlay layer. And this layer is made up of, uh, of agents that work closely with the CNI to, to implement the, uh, the zero trust networking behaviors that, that we want from, uh, uh, from the service mesh. So this component, these components of the Z tunnels in this diagram, they take on the responsibility of assigning workload identity to the workloads on the node and doing things like originating and terminating uh, TLS for mutual TLS, 
and enforcing networking policies based on these identities. Now, a service mesh needs to be able to do more than just you know, establishing or not establishing connections. We need to be able to understand what's in the request, what tokens or headers or uh, claims are part of the request. Um, and so we need to have layer seven understanding of what's happening in, in the service mesh as well. And so um, what, what we've done is separate that out. So if you look at a, a request path, if you just, if you don't need any of the layer seven introspection, then the traffic can stay in this secure overlay layer that is uh, quite a bit faster than um, having to use any layer seven proxies. So the sidecar approach included. And, and we get the properties of, of zero trust that, that we would need. If we want to include more sophisticated layer seven policies, then that traffic will then first go through the secure overlay layer and then make it to a workload specific layer seven proxy or a waypoint proxy that we call it here that then handles any other sophisticated layer seven uh, aware policies that need to apply to a particular workload. In this case, you know, a service A is talking to service B and those, um, you know, maybe, maybe we're checking for JOT uh, tokens, we're checking claims or, or other opaque tokens. We verify that they're there, that they haven't been tampered with, and then we will you know, make decisions about what APIs, what endpoints and so on can be reached for, uh, for service B. So Istio Ambient Mesh is, uh, you know, does bring a, a lot of optimizations, a lot of benefits to the Istio project. Um, we released it in September. It is, it's, it's probably, and, and actually just Friday this, this last week, um, you know, it, it moved into the Istio mainline uh, of, of the code. So it will be in the next release. Um, and uh, is is well on its way. Certainly here on the solo side, we're working on making this production ready uh, very soon. And um, you know, it, there, it comes with a lot of benefits. So we don't need to alter our deployments and inject sidecars, agents, whatever. Um, and you you kind of sidestep some of the challenges that come up when you do have to do that. Certainly the, the folks on the webinar here that are familiar with injecting a sidecar into Kubernetes know there's some challenges there. There's uh, race conditions between the containers. You know, job resources are not, they don't play very well with sidecar containers. If you have your own init containers, there's some collisions possible there. So without, if you don't need to inject sidecars, you alleviate some of those, uh, some of those uh, cases. Things like upgrading and patching of the service mesh infrastructure itself are done out of band of the application now. There's always a little friction when you take a piece of infrastructure and kind of jam it in with the application, right? Because the, 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 the platforms, the infrastructure, they need to be serviced, they need to be maintained, they need to be patched. And they, they probably do that on a different cadence and what the applications are, are doing. So that they probably need to decouple that. And here in the ambient data plane for Istio, we see that uh, upgrading, patching, all this is transparent to the application. Um, and, and we can do that with much more minimal uh, oversight and governance and, and, and focus on coordination, which apps can be restarted and, and, and so on. Um, other, other areas we maintain, a lot of the foundations of zero trust for uh, network security that we have with the sidecar-based service mesh. Um, and, and we do see areas of, uh, of improved performance, uh, especially when you're just adopting the service mesh for, uh, for security. So that is uh, where I'll end the presentation. I'll do a quick demo here. Um, and then I'll come back and uh, we should have a few minutes for questions.
questions? Okay, so the first thing that you'll see is we have a Kubernetes cluster that is running. It's running some some more clothes here. Oh, oh what's going on here? Okay. Oh, there we go. We see uh, just keeping this about as basic as you can get it. Uh, hello world. We have a sleep application. We have a couple of hello world applications. Some of these these uh, hello world applications are deployed on uh, on different nodes in cluster. We can see that there are at least two different nodes here. And if we come into the sleep application, we can call hello world on port 5000. And we see we get uh, responses. And those responses are load balanced across those two different instances of hello world. On the bottom pane, you can see that uh, we have our default namespace. We have some of the cube specific cluster namespaces, but we don't have Istio installed here. So we haven't installed Istio yet. If we go into default, we can see that, that that's where our uh, sleep in hello world is. Now, if we come here, we're going to install Istio and we're going to do that and set the profile equal to ambient because we want to enable the ambient data plane for, for Istio. So here we're going to give that a few moments to install. And what this is going to do is it's going to install Istio that uh, you're probably familiar with if you are. Uh, things like the control plane will be installed. I believe it'll install an, an ingress gateway. Yes, it looks like it is. And it'll install the components that are necessary to run in the ambient mode. So if we give that a second, we come back here. What we should see now of the namespaces listed here, Istio system is, is one of those. So Istio has been installed, click into it. We can see the Istio D, which is our control plane component. We can see the ingress gateway and um, you know a few components that make up the secure overlay layer, including the Z-Tone. Now, if we make a few calls, that's actually, let's, let's come here. Let's, let's go into the default namespace. We're gonna take a look at the sleep app. The sleep application here is running on the node ambient worker. Okay, so, if we come back and look at our, our diagrams here for requests to go through the service mesh, they will first go through the secure overlay layer, which is the Z tunnel component, and then eventually to their destination. So what we want to do is let's take a look at the Z tunnel component that's running on this node ambient worker. So if we come here, the Istio system namespace, we find Z-Tunnel, and we'll find the Z-Tunnel that's running on the ambient worker node. If we take a look at our logs, we'll full screen that. And if we make some calls here, we'll see we're not, we're not seeing any, any traffic go through. That's because we haven't, we haven't told Istio that these applications should be part of the mesh. In the sidecar approach, what you do is you install the sidecar, but we don't want to install the sidecar. What we want to do is we want to include those workloads in the mesh, but we'll do, do it some, some other way, dynamic way. And, and the way we're going to do that is by labeling our workloads with, uh, with a particular label that says, hey, you're part of the service mesh, the ambient service mesh. If we do that, and we come back and now when we call hello world, we should see access logs going through the Z tunnel component and on the bottom pane here. Uh, and we should also see that the traffic is starting to use mutual TLS and is, is, is verifying things like spiffy IDs and, and workload IDs and so on. And, and that the traffic is going to the Z tunnel. So if I click hello, we should see down on the bottom, 
access logging that confirms that indeed our traffic is going through the Z tunnel now. Um, and then we can see based on some of what, what the logs look like that we are uh, going through the components that require mutual TLS. I'm running a little bit short on time. I could pull up the uh, you know, um, TCP dump or Wireshark to show you that it is mutual TLS, um, but I'll, uh, I can leave you, I can point you to another, another demo that does that. Okay, so that's, that's good. We get mutual TLS, we can enforce traffic policies now because things are going through this service mesh. But what if we wanted to um, take advantage of some of the layer seven capabilities that a service mesh brings into the picture? Uh, maybe we want to test what, you know, how our security posture changes or behaves when things start to fail. All right, we can get the, uh, the golden path or the, uh, um, you know, the, the expected path going, but when things start to become chaotic, how, do thing, how, does, how does our security posture behave there? Uh, in, in, service, in the Istio, in the service mesh, what we can do is layer seven policies like uh, um, checking for JOT tokens, injecting faults, um, controlling traffic routing, and so on. In ambient mesh, what we what we do is let's see, we, we deploy the waypoint proxy. So we will let's do that first and I'll show you the we'll deploy the waypoint proxy. And that proxy is this right here. Right? Because we want to see this. We want to end up seeing traffic go through the waypoint proxy and have layer seven capabilities applied. And if we come here. Uh, we should see a, uh, a waypoint proxy has now been deployed that represents Hello World. Uh, it's been running for 23 seconds. And now what we want to do is create a layer seven policy that injects a delay whenever we call the Hello World service. And the delay is established for five seconds. So if I add this, Come back to my applications and call hello world, cross our fingers, we should see traffic go through Z tunnel and we should see the uh, traffic delayed by five seconds because it's now going to the waypoint proxy. See one, two, three, four, five ish, right? And so now we, we get the full behavior of uh, um, fault injection and layer seven that uh, we expect from a service mesh. But again, if you come back and look at my workloads, I don't have any sidecar proxies running here. In fact, these workloads have been running for you know quite a long time in this cluster. The only thing we've deployed is a single proxy that represents Hello World and still gives us the, the layer seven granularity that we need for enforcing certain networking policies or, or security policies. Now, if we decide that we don't want service mesh anymore, uh, we don't want the service mesh anymore, we want to remove it, so then we will unlabel or no, no, no. We'll label, re remove the label, uh, the data plane uh, label. And then we will uninstall Istio using the normal, normal approach to uninstalling Istio. And then if we come back here, we'll see the uh, Istio system namespace should get, uh, maybe I didn't delete it. Uh, I think I have a, I install this, all right, there we go. And we'll see the Istio system namespace will go away. Our application, work, you know, our workloads are still up and running like they've been running and uh, we can still call Hello World. Now if we don't take any advantage of any of the service mesh capabilities, but the applications haven't been touched. So that's the uh, end of the demo there. Let me, let me leave you with a few resources. Um, we've, uh, We've written a white paper that goes into more detail about how this all comes together, uh, specifically around Istio ambient mesh. Um, we've, uh, we, we've built a few, some other top, some other content around uh, 
how a how a mesh or a gateway and mesh technology together combined can provide a, a fairly sophisticated set of zero trust controls. And then the last bit, I, I didn't go into what we, you know, the, the products here at Solo, but we actually tie this in deeper into the um, into the CNI, into the lower layer network. So you can think of Solo as an enterprise service mesh uh, that is uh, built specifically to be more secure um, than, uh, than, than what people see in the community or any of our other competitors or, or anything like that. Uh, take a look at academy.solo.io as a free resource for uh, getting hands-on with this technology. And um, obviously the, uh, the, the blogs, the books, uh, all, all that are good stuff. And then join us in the, in the Istio community as well if you'd like to get involved. So that's all I all I have for for today. Um, I know we've got a couple minutes left. Let's see. Uh, somebody asked about the uh, slide deck. Yes, we will. So I will uh, I'll make these available to uh, to the organizers here. I'll also tweet them from uh, my my Twitter uh, account, uh, that would be what shown here, uh, but I will make them available. So uh, I see a question here. Can the ambient mesh be integrated with a workload identity provider like Spire? Uh, can you use proxy get X519? Uh, and the answer is yes, actually. Uh, we've, done, we've done a lot of work with our customers to, um, to integrate Spire for better workload attestation and identity uh, issuing. And uh, Istio Ambient is no different. Um, we Ambient actually, the, the way the secure overlay layer works, it works similarly enough to how the sidecars work to get workload identity. So being able to plug Spire in um, would be you know, is 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 fairly straightforward and something that we're working on. Uh, so definitely. Uh, can ambient mesh function across clusters, similar to a sidecar mesh? So basically, asking, uh, I believe, about multi-cluster support, uh, potentially routing, failover, that kind of stuff. And the answer is yes. Uh, that is something we are actively working on right now. And I, I think we do have uh, um, some working working POCs around that. When we announced Istio back in September, we knew that there were a couple gaps between what the, what the ambient approach could do and what the sidecar approach can do. And uh, certainly here at Solo, we've been working on closing those gaps and, uh, and we're almost there. We're actually all very close to, to being there. And multi-cluster, cross-cluster, failover, et cetera, those use cases are very core and near and dear to uh, what we do here at Solo. So yes, the Ambient Mesh will uh, definitely be supporting that. Thank you for your question. Um, another question that I, so, and I'm, I'm happy to take uh, any others or we can do it offline too, but um, another question that I get is, if you're already running sidecars, uh, can you introduce ambient? Um, and along those lines, you know, going forward, what will be the default for, for Istio? And so the answer to the first part of that question is definitely yes. The, uh, the ambient approach and the sidecar approach are interoperable with each other. Uh, and there is a, uh, a path that we can uh, that we will, you know, continue to uh, document and uh, and show for kind of transitioning from a sidecar to a, a data uh, a sidecarless uh, approach. Um, and then, lastly, longer term, Istio Ambient will likely be the default data plane in uh, in Istio, and we would reserve the sidecar approach, which is not going away, um, for more for use cases where you need a little bit more control. You need dedicated resources and um, and 
and, and policy enforcement. Usually those would be edge cases, but we certainly don't expect the sidecar approach to go away. So I know that's uh, that's my time, and I don't want to I don't want to overstay my welcome here. Uh, but certainly reach out to me. I'll post slides. I'll make them available to the organizers. And I appreciate uh, you all for for joining me on this webinar. Thank you so much, Christian, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day.